All right. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I titled this staying ahead of the baddies because I don't want people to be scared. I don't want people to be intimidated. And I don't I, basically I want this to be a friendly and approachable way of talking about a very important topic. So I'm using loose terminology and I hope you'll forgive me for that because I'm not in work now. So I'm allowed to do that. Uh, so by day, I've been with Maynooth University for a very long time. Uh, I started off as a researcher there. Then I went on to be a sysadmin for many years. And as of last November, I am the university's cybersecurity specialist. So I get to worry about these things 24-7. <laughs> but, you know, hey, it's, I enjoy it. I did apply for the job. So, you know. Um, as well as that, I have also uh, run my own business called Bardifizzer Creations. I do some open source software development. I do some IT consulting. I also love podcasting. Um, I have two of my own shows, Let's Talk Apple and Let's Talk Photography. I do. I work on the idea of being monthly. So I have a monthly Apple show where we zoom out and we look at the big picture. And my photography show is very loose. It's basically anything I want to talk about about photography. Yeah, I call it you know the art and craft of photography. So it really could be anything. Uh, and then Alison Sheridan, who is another Mac podcaster, has me on her show quite often. I do a bi-weekly segment called Security Bits. Um, and together we have done a huge series called Taming the Terminal, where I teach Alison how not how to use the terminal. Um, Alison, we started this when Alison retired uh, and I taught her how to use the terminal together. And now we are learning how to program together. Um, and it is, it is good fun. We are in episode 148 of programming by stealth. So wow. we've been at it a while. I am also your people. I went to do this slide and I was going to include all of the Macs I've used in work too. And I realized it would never work. So this is just what I spend my money on. And basically if I buy tech, I buy Apple stuff. In work, I have to be a Windows and Linux and everything else. But when I open my checkbook, Apple stuff falls out. Um, so, the, you know, for fun, I'm definitely a Mac user of every shape, size and whatever you want. OK, so let's get stuck in here, right? If you want to defend yourself, the most important thing to know is who is out to get you, because that will determine how you respond. Now, if I was giving this talk to a bunch of CEOs, I would be giving a very different slide with a lot of what we call threat actors, right? There will be lots of names on the slide from hostile governments to activists to all sorts of people to worry about. But we're regular folk. Some of us are a little bit more unlucky that we have a few more things to worry about. But on average, for regular folk, we have one adversary. It is cyber criminals. And knowing that what we're worried about is criminals, believe it or not, makes our life a lot easier. So I should just call out that if you are a major business personality, that fact will leak into your personal life and put you at extra risk. If you're someone who's a lawyer on behalf of civil rights or you're campaigning for something, that will also leak into your personal life. And if you're some sort of internet celebrity, if you're a John Gruber or something, well, that will leak into your personal life and you'll have extra things to worry about. And unfortunately, some of us will suffer some sort of stalking, and that is a whole different kettle of fish. So I do want to acknowledge that some people have more to worry about, but for the vast, vast majority of us, and for the purpose of this evening, cyber criminals are the baddies. And knowing that is actually a really big advantage to us. So the reason it's an advantage to know that the baddies are cyber criminals is because we know what they want. They want profit. And it's not, strictly speaking, just money. Money is by far the easiest form of profit, right? The, the shortest path to getting rich is getting money. But they will happily also steal your crypto coins, your NFTs. Data is very valuable. Like one credit card number might not be worth much, but if you can steal a few thousand of them, that actually is worth a lot. Uh, access to other people's accounts is really valuable because there is an industry of crime. And basically, if you want to buy the ability to spam people, you need access to a bunch of pre-hacked Twitter accounts. So there are some criminals whose job it is to go and hack people's accounts and then sell those hacked accounts to people whose job it is to do something else. 
So while you might think, well, my account isn't valuable, I'm a nobody. No, but it is valuable because it can be sold as part of a job lot. And there are people who want to buy accounts. And in fact, the more normal your account is, the more valuable it is because it won't show up on anyone's spam filters and stuff, right? The more un the more normal you are, the more useful you are for spreading all sorts of phishing attacks and stuff. So believe it or not, all of our accounts are valuable. And the other way we're all valuable is our, our computers all have resources. So if you want to send out 5 million spam messages, if you send them all out from your computer, your computer will get blocked very quickly. If you send 50 from Bob and 50 from Jane and 50 from someone else and 50 from someone else, that's really hard to defend against. That's really hard to block. So there are cyber criminals who go around hacking people's devices. A lot of it these days, by the way, is really subtle stuff like your, your internet connected camera, you forgot to put the software update on. And you collect, you use some malware and you collect a few thousand of these devices and you sell them as a job lot. And then you make yourself a few thousand dollars, pounds, sorry, I keep I'm saying euros, not dollars, pounds, a few thousand pounds of profit just from a bunch of people's webcams. So all of us have something of value to the bad guys. Are we Sorry, the baddies. I'm trying to be non-gendered, right? Bad, baddies come in all shapes and sizes. So we, even though we don't think we're important because we're just regular folk, we're still of value. But there is, of course, a flip side to that because if it's all about profit, well, that means our adversaries think economically. That's really to our advantage. So if we were in the crosshairs of Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, we would have a much bigger problem because their wallets are effectively infinite. But when your attacker is out to make a profit, you don't need perfect protection. You just need to be economically unappealing. It needs to be more financial hassle than it's worth to get you. That means that the bar for us is really reachable. It's, this is not an impossible mountain to climb. We just have to do the basics so that we're not the cheapest people to hack. And that's, that's kind of it. It's the old euphemism, you know, you don't need to outrun the bear, you just need to outrun your friend. You just need to be not the easiest people to hack. And then you will be way, way, way safer because the people out to get us are out to make a profit. So it's just economics. And that's a real comfort to me that it's just economics. So the actual technological detail changes really, really fast. But when you zoom out, the tactics and the stuff they're trying to do, that hasn't changed in decades, which is also to our advantage. So what are they trying to do? There's two targets. There's what I like to call the squishy organic bit, i.e. us, because we humans are very flawed and we can be played like a cheap fiddle. And if we're aware of how humans get played, it's much easier not to get played. But I promise you, no matter how aware you are, you will get caught. Right. And I'm going to tell you this because I think it's important to never feel bad if it happens to you. Everyone gets caught. I guess the one difference of being prepared is that you probably will realize you've been caught. This happened in the office about four weeks ago. We were all working away in our cubicles and all of a sudden, a loud string of expletives came from the back of the room. And our senior sysadmin went bleepity bleep bleep bleep. I just fell for a phishing attack. Now, this is a man who has been working in IT his entire life, since he was a student, he did it part-time. He's now close to retirement. He has been an IT professional his entire life, and he fell for a phishing email. Now, the difference is, because he knows about stuff, he recognized what he'd done a few minutes after he'd done it. He was able to reset his password, reset his multi-factor authentication, and he was able to, to stop the damage because he realized immediately that he had done it wrong. But he did it wrong. So don't ever feel ashamed of saying you fell for something. Don't ever feel ashamed of asking for help. Don't ever feel ashamed of reporting a crime to the police if you're the victim of it. It happens everyone. We're all human, and they know, the baddies know we're human. And gosh darn, we're a very predictable bunch.
right? So on the one hand, we should know how they're trying to attack us, but never feel bad. Never feel it's your fault. You do your best, you understand things, and I promise you, I've fallen for things. My colleague recently fell for things. Everyone falls for things. The other way they go after us is our stuff, our technology, right? So if they're not trying to trick us or extort us, they're trying to become us by taking over our accounts or hack our stuff, take over our devices. So trick us, extort us, take over our accounts, take over our devices. That is what they're trying to do since the dawn of time, and that will be what they're trying to do forever. So that's what we're trying to defend ourselves from. So how do we defend ourselves? I would, ar well, I will argue uh, that there are three important things we need to do. We absolutely need to maintain our vigilance. If it wasn't for copyright issues, there'd be a giant picture of Mad Eye Moody here, right? Ever present vigilance, if any of you are into the Harry Potter series. Be suspicious of the unexpected. And I think a very, it's difficult, right? So I'm going to say this as if it's easy. Just remain rational. There, the baddies know how to push our buttons. They will try to trigger an emotion. And we humans, when our emotions are triggered, do dumb things. And so try to recognize when you're being manipulated and try to be suspicious. No, you won't always succeed. Just try. The other thing is what I call good digital hygiene. We know we should wash our hands. You know, for the last couple of years, we know we should wear our masks. So we're used to the idea that you get less sick less often if you do some simple things in the physical world. Well, there's digital equivalents of that. And the simple stuff doesn't, it's not a case that if I do 5% of what's possible, I will get 5% of the protection. No, if you do the 10 easiest percent of things that can possibly be done, you will be protected from 90% of problems. The payoff on the basics is huge. And that's really reassuring, both with my professional hat on and as the family IT person. The simple stuff makes a really big difference. Because remember, it's still, we're not out running the bear. We just need to not be the low hanging fruit. So small stuff matters. It's also much more difficult to trick a person who has some basic knowledge. And you don't need to be a computer scientist. You don't need to be a cybersecurity specialist, but a little bit of digital literacy goes an awful, awful long way. And so knowing 10% of what is out there will arm you against a lot of stuff because you, your spidey sense will be able to go, hang on a second. And that's all it takes, right? Just hang on a second is probably one of the most important things you'll ever say in your life. Like, hang on a second, is that? really my bank? Is that really my boss asking me to wire money to someone? Is that really my darling beloved asking me to do X, Y, or Z? You know, hang on a second. That, that's a very important thing to say. And the other thing I will make a passionate argument for is don't, don't unthinkingly do things on computers. Stop, think, and make an actual decision. So it's always trade-offs. It's trade-offs all the way down because it is definitely easier to not do any security. And it is also the case that you could go completely nuts and secure everything to the point that you actually can't use your computer, get no joy out of the things, and don't have a digital existence. Both of those are as bad. You're constantly making an informed decision. All right. I know I should use two-factor authentication. I also know I don't have the time or the energy to do it everywhere. So I'm going to decide that every website I enter my credit card in gets two-factor authentication. You've now been deliberate, proactive, you've managed your risk. So just take the time to think. So what I'm hoping is vigilance, good digital hygiene, and digital literacy will arm you to be deliberate. Just make actual choices. Pro, you know, think to yourself, I know this isn't the ideal security, but I'm perfectly happy to do this because I'm low risk or because I'm going to put my energy into this way more important thing because I know I only have so much energy. You know, be realistic, be fair, be deliberate. Yeah. Again, that's easy to say, hard to do, but I'm just going to make my passionate case and hope some of it sinks in.
So I want to focus on the three numbered things, vigilance, good digital hygiene, and a bit of basic digital literacy. That's what I want to focus on. So vigilance, right? Remember again, we as regular folk, our attacker is a cyber criminal. Money, 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 money. So whenever you're doing things, always follow the money. If it doesn't make economic sense, stop. Something's wrong. Either you don't understand something or it is a scam. But if, if there is something that is offering you free X, Y, or Z, and you cannot understand how they're making their money, figure out how they're making their money, decide if you agree with it or not, or recognize it as a scam. And this comes in all sorts of forms, right? So Google offer you free email. That's free, so follow the money. How do Google offer you free email? They advertise like heck at you. They scan your entire inbox to figure out what you like. Then they sell your eyeballs to advertisers because they know that they can say, hi, we can sell you access to Bob who's really into canoeing. Or we can sell you access to Bart who loves mountain biking. Or we can sell, yo, that's how they make money. So economically, it works perfectly and they're a very profitable company. So you as the user are basically going, okay, so I'm giving up privacy in exchange for an email service. I'm happy with that, then use Gmail. I'm not happy with that, don't use Gmail, but you'll probably have to open your wallet and pay someone to provide you with an email service. Wikipedia then is another example. So you go to Wikipedia and it's an amazing resource and it's free. How is it free? Well, it's a charitable foundation. Okay, follow the money, nothing to worry about here. It's a charity, great, that's how lots of things are charities. Okay, cool, I could use Wikipedia and I'm fine. You go to a website saying, free Mac anti-malware scanning. Click here now. And there is no visible way that this company is making money. It's a scam. They're not doing it for fun. So if the money doesn't make sense, be suspicious. Figure out what you don't understand or recognize it as a scam because either you don't understand the, how the money's made or they're lying to you about how the money is made. One of those two things. So I would always say, follow the money, follow the money, follow the money. It probably goes without saying that if it's too good to be true, it almost certainly is. That was true before we invented the computer. That was true before we invented the internet. That will be true forever. If something is too good to be true, someone is trying to pull a fast one. Just be suspicious of an overly good offer. Do this and you'll magically get a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Don't think you will. I think one of the most important things I would like people to take away from today is that our emotions are the baddies trump cards. They are continuously trying to manipulate us and they can take sort of a positive or a negative approach to manipulating us. So they can go for our base emotions. They can make us angry. And particularly in the modern political climate, a lot of attackers feed off the fact that there's a lot of anger in the world today. So anger is a very powerful weapon at the moment. Another very powerful weapon at the moment, literally in a time of war, there's a lot going on in the world during COVID as well. Fear has been a very effective way of getting people to turn off their brain by triggering fear. And for as long as I have known human beings, I'm afraid to say we've all been a little bit prone to the old greed. So greed is definitely one of the attacker's favorite ways of turning off our brain offer us something shiny. But unfortunately, these people are not moral. They know most of us are. They know that most people are nice people. So the other approach they take, which I find like there should be an extra circle of hell for attackers who go this route. Whenever something horrible happens, like the recent earthquake in Turkey, I promise you within 24 hours, there are baddies abusing that to, to defraud people of their money within hours of a horrible event like that. So the fact that most of us are compassionate human beings is turned against us by some of these people. It is disgusting. It makes me very, very cranky, but it is a fact. And so we need to be aware of the fact. So if something horrible happens and you feel you want to give Médecins Sans Frontières, the Red Cross, you go to people who have earned a reputation through years of hard work and you give 
that way. A random email comes in saying, give money now and help this poor little kitty cat or whatever. No, you didn't go looking for them. It's probably a scam. And unfortunately, and this makes me even sadder, another emotion that they like to pull is love. We all want to love and to be loved. Right? I don't want to sound too soppy here, but but good people. And it is a big thing at the moment to spend months making friends with people online and then slowly twisting the conversation to an investment opportunity, which is, of course, not an investment opportunity. And you end up encouraging your online friend to invest in something. They do. You then proceed to go silent and run away with all the money. And you will never be heard. You know, the, the attacker will never be heard from again. I heard an interview with a lady recently saying, well, yes, they did get two million, but I'm lucky enough that I can survive without it. I have a few more. I thought, wow. But this is how bad some of these things get, right? So unless you have two million to spare, I'm afraid to say we all need to be a little bit careful. So if someone, if you are, if your emotions are rising, ask yourself, am I still thinking logically? And just be aware that going after your emotions is, is what's done. And another one that's very, very, very important. A lot of attackers make use of a false sense of emergency. Because if we make you rush, you don't think. We, we all know this in real life. If you're rushing out the door, you forget all sorts of important things like turning off the gas, locking the door, goodness only knows what. So if I can trick you into rushing, your brain is off. I can trick you into doing things you wouldn't normally do. Act now or else. Hurry, there's only four left, right? It's a false sense of urgency, a false sense of scarcity. Don't allow yourself to be rushed. That's, I think, very, very important. So vigilance is vital. I would also say there are some red flags to look out for, particularly if you're getting, you know, some sort of a communication, right? Be it an email or an SMS message or an instant message or whatever, right? Some sort of communication. Be wary of some common red flags, right? Anomalous language is what I'll say, right? So is the tone correct? If I'm actually getting a communication from my bank, my bank will have a corporate tone. If they're an old fashioned established bank, it'll be a very formal tone. If they're one of these modern hip internet only banks, it'll be a very playful tone. But a bank will have a tone. They will have a corp, they will have a way of communicating with you. And if you've been their customer for 10, 20 years, you know what your bank sounds like. If you get an email that looks like it's from your bank, but the tone is wrong, be suspicious. That's a red flag. For years, the advice was if the grammar's off, it's a scam. And it's still true that if the grammar is garbage, it's not real. But the inverse isn't true anymore. If the grammar is good, it doesn't mean it's legitimate because thanks to stuff like chat GPT, you can literally ask chat GPT to turn a bunch of garbled pseudo English into formal business email and chat GPT will oblige. I've seen this demonstrated um, we have a little a little monthly get together of uh, fellow cybersecurity specialists, uh, and we played around with this. You can ask ChatGPT to turn broken English into a very realistic corporate email. So grammar being good is not a sign that all is well, but grammar being terrible absolutely is a sign that something is wrong. So it's a red flag, but it's not a green flag. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Another thing I'm always wary of is. If I get a communication from someone claiming to be someone or some organization I have a relationship with, do they know things they shouldn't? Because that's a red flag. Hang on a sec. My bank doesn't know where I'm going on holidays. Why are they suddenly telling me, oh, we believe you're off to Greenland soon. Why don't you do X or Z? And there's also the converse. If I get a communication from someone or some organization I've worked with before and their email it's clear to me that they don't actually know I live in Ireland. They're sort of assuming I'm an American or something. Well, hang on a second. They really should know that. So if they know things they shouldn't or don't know things they should, red flag, be suspicious. There's something, this is off. This doesn't smell right. Vigilance. The other one is 
is this how they normally reach out to me? Right. So if like my bank sends me an email once a month to tell me not to fall for phishing emails, I'm used to this. This is what they do. But if my bank all of a sudden sent me an email saying that there was suspicious activity on my credit card, it's like, no, that's not normal. My bank normally does that over SMS. So why is this not normal? Right. So whatever is normal, if it's not normal, well, hang on a second, something going on here. And the other big red flag is, does this contradict flat out a promise made to you? So if your bank sends you an email every month saying, we will never ask for your personal email over the phone, your phone rings and says, hi, I'm from Barty Bank. What's your first, what's your mother's maiden name? Well, hang on a sec. No, my bank has promised me once a month, every month that they will never phone me to ask for this information. There's a phone call saying they're my bank. I don't think so. This is wrong. Or we will never ask for a password by email or phone number. And you suddenly get an email saying, please reply with your password or your account will be deleted in four minutes, right? False urgency, all that stuff, right? If it contradicts what they say, that's a red flag. So, you know, a big part of Vigilance is knowing these red flags and watching out for them. Our second defense then is good digital hygiene. And I'm going to break that into three things I want to talk to you about. Passwords, accounts, and software. So in terms of passwords, right, I'm just going to say this a hundred times. Don't reuse passwords. Don't reuse passwords. Don't reuse passwords. Don't reuse passwords. Passwords. <sighs> Websites are often written by people who are very keen to have a website, but don't actually have the skills to run a website, which means they get hacked to pieces and all of those password databases get stolen. There are not millions of stolen passwords. There are billions with a capital B and two billion with a capital B were taken from Yahoo alone a few years ago. That's just one hack, right? There are more leaked passwords than human beings on this planet by an order of magnitude. And what attackers do is they take the password stolen elsewhere and try them on sites they actually care about. So if I know that you use this email address and this password to sign up to some silly little blog that doesn't matter at, at all, it's irrelevant. I'm going to try that same combination, say, on World of Warcraft, where you might have 400 gold coin you've worked ages on with your dragon to collect or you may have credit on PayPal, or like so many places on the internet where you have things of value. They can even be tokens and in-game credit you can sell off for real money, right? They can be amazing things you can get value from. Just try the password. Or they're just trying to steal your Twitter account to sell it for profit. Well, just try the email address and password they stole from random blog that doesn't matter a darn. And they will get in. It's called password stuffing. It's extremely effective. And then you can sell those passwords as being verified because we tried a million, 1% of them worked, we still have a massive payday. So don't reuse passwords. And that has an immediate effect. Because remember I said, we're all human. We all have our human flaws. I can't remember five passwords. I have, I checked my password manager. I have 400 passwords. I can't remember five of them. The only way that works is with a password manager. So I really do think that in 2023, everyone needs to get on the password manager bus. Put all of your mental energy into one amazingly strong password. I would even say a pass phrase. Have that protect your password vault and then allow the password vault to do the heavy lifting of protecting your unique passwords everywhere else. So that is the single most important thing I can possibly say to you today. Don't reuse passwords. I will also appeal to you not to pick your own. We humans are terrible at randomness. We think, if I say to you, give me a random name, that will be so heavily influenced by who happens to be in the news, which TV shows happen to be popular. It's astonishing. And the attackers, when they attack passwords, they don't do it at random. They do it based on what is currently trending on Twitter, what is currently popular on the television, all of this feeds into the databases attackers use to go after passwords. And we humans, we pick stuff based on birthdays, like random numbers that start with, you know, like dates only go from one to 31. So if you're trying to guess a random sequence of numbers, if you stick to yourself between one and 31, 
you're going to get way more hits because people use their birthday. So if you pick the first two digits between 1 and 31, the second two digits between 1 and 12, and the next four digits between, say, 1960 and 1980 or something, you're going to capture so many more people than if you actually try random numbers. If you, I don't know what's, you know, if you pick passwords based on who's currently kicking football is the best for Man United, you're going to hit so many more victims than if you just pick words at random. So we humans can't be random. So let the computer choose the password. Since the password manager is storing it for us, why not let it generate it too? So don't rely on our terrible human brains. Let We have a password manager anyway. Let it do the work of picking our passwords. The other thing I will say is there is defense in length. So this is particularly important for that one password that you're going to remember for your password manager. It is not, You do not need to have uppercase, lowercase symbols and numbers if your password is long. Either make it short and impossible for a human being or make it long and easy for a human being. We're human beings, long and easy. Uh, I think it was Stanford University started this trend and because they're so famous, other people have been able to copy them. Their rule was if your password is shorter than 12 characters, you must have uppercase, you must have lowercase, you must have symbols, you must have digits. If your password is 16 or longer, forget about the symbols. If your password is 20 or longer, do whatever you like. And that is, uh, uh, that is something being adopted more widely. Make people make it 20 long and then stop insisting they have weird characters and stuff. If it's 20 characters long, defense in length. It also means you can make it something else human beings have a chance with. I like to use random generators that pick sequences of words and make them good and long. And then I make up a story in my head to match the sequence of words the computer chose. So don't let me pick the words because I'm a silly human. Let the computer pick the words and I'll invent a silly story that connects the words. And I'm only trying to remember a small, small number of passwords, like my personal password manager, my work password manager. It's a very, very, very small subset of passwords I'm left with. And I just make them really bloody long. Length, length, length. The other thing I would say is when possible, use two-factor authentication or the more modern version, multi-factor authentication. So 2FA or MFA. This basically means your username, your password, and something else. Something you know, something you are, something you have. So something you know is some sort of extra piece of information. Something you have is some sort of hardware token and something, um, or it can be some sort of code that shows up on your phone or whatever. Uh, and something you are is biometrics, fingerprint scanner, face ID. That's something you are. It's basically, that's an extra factor. So that's where you get these 2FA and MFA. Turn it on. Um, any form of multi-factor authentication is better than no multi-factor authentication, but there is a hierarchy. So there is a, because it's an economics exercise, there are now, it's actually, there's actually something called malware as a service. It's actually a thing now. So you don't even have software as a service. You can have malware as a service. And in the last six months, you can now buy what's called a uh, two-factor authentication proxy. So what the attackers do is they pay a low, low, low paid worker somewhere in the third world to sit at a computer screen. And you go to log into something that uses uh, two-factor authentication. And they take the screen that should have come to you and they, they send you a copy of it, but they also send it to the attacker they're paying in India or wherever. And you are actually typing your password into something they control. And it asks you for the code that they've sent to your phone over SMS and you type it in, but you're typing it into the wrong place. That gets sent to the person in India on minimum wage who then types it in and they, they come in as you. Because human beings are now so cheap in some parts of the world that it's economically viable to pay someone to sit there in real time and steal people's multi-factor authentication codes. So now there's a move towards phishing proof multi-factor authentication. So this is where instead of it being an SMS message, a thing, a push notification comes to your phone and you have to react to the push notification and that can't be intercepted. So phishing resistant multi-factor authentication is king of the hill. But remember, it's all about making yourself as, you just need to be not the worst. So if you can't have a fancy pants push notification, fine, a hardware token is almost as good. The time-based one-time passwords, your Google Authenticator basically, that's better than nothing. 
email a code is actually better than SMS. A voice call with a code is still better than SMS. And probably the lowest thing on the rung of the ladder is SMS because unfortunately, it's actually quite easy to steal your cell phone number. It's called SIM jacking and it's shockingly easy. So in order of preference, a push notification win, some sort of a hardware token is great. And then you're into the things, you enter a code. The Google Authenticator, better than email, better than voice, better than SMS. If I were giving this talk in five years, I would tell you passwords are dead, and I would be delighted to tell you that. We are unfortunately not yet five years from now. There is a thing called pass keys. You will hear about it. It is the future. It is an actual path away from passwords. It's not ready yet. Give it a year or two. But for now, know it's coming. And when you hear people be excited about pass keys, know that they're excited for real. I am very excited about pass keys. But for I am not advising, you know, my friends and family to start using pass keys yet. They're too new. Give it a few more years and then the password will be dead. Which is a very happy thing to be able to say, because it's much easier to just use passkeys and password managers and all the shenanigans, right? So there is light on the horizon. It's not a train. So it's light at the end of this tunnel. We're not there just yet. Well, before we I continue, wanna... can I? Yeah. Sorry, can I just interrupt you with a few few questions? So a yes, a couple of personal questions, which I think might appeal to uh, many people listening at the moment. Um, any views on Apple Keychain? Yes, I do. Apple Keychain is an extremely good password manager. If you live entirely in the Apple world, then you have a password manager that is really good for free. No effort. In fact, they've integrated it into the operating system in such a way that it's really low friction. So if you can live in that ecosystem, yes, do it. If you need to be able to get your passwords on Windows computers, I mean, there is now an integration between Keychain and the Edge browser. You can get a plugin for Edge that does Keychain. So it's becoming more available. But if you're an Android and an iOS user or an Android and a Mac user, or if you need to use lots of computers that aren't your physical property, then Apple Keychain isn't sufficient. But if you live in Apple's ecosystem and it works for you, yes. Definitely use Apple Keychain. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. It's really well integrated. It's low friction. It generates passwords for you. You actually have to go out of your way to put in a human-entered password. Like they do all the right things. And they will also transition you to pass keys without you having to do any work once they become available. Uh -huh. So yes, if you can live in that universe, live in that universe, enjoy it, it's great. But know that it's not enough for power users. They will need to consider one password. I would have said last pass up until a few months ago. Don't do that. Uh, one password. Um, there's another one, an open source one that Leo Laporte and those guys love. Oh, just on a blank now. Um, I'm a one password user, so that one wins for me. Um, that was my next question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, there's Dashlane is decent. And then there's the open source one. Oh, why is my brain gone blank on it? Bitwarden. Bitwarden. That's the one I was going to say. So one password, Bitwarden, Dashlane, they seem to be doing quite well. Last pass, 10 foot barge pole, no. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a question from, what a comment really from Jim Turney. Jim, would you care to just unmute and just um, give us your comment? Sure. <clears throat> sure. I, my concern about pass keys from what I know about them is that they might be centrally controlled at least indirectly and because we don't have possession of them we don't have the database of what um, our pass keys are and if that's the case then they can be very the dangerous your access can be cut and then you don't have access to any of the things that require a pass key is that possible no no that's not how pass keys work um thankfully thank goodness um they're they're much better designed than that so what's going on with the pass key is actually a very, very old idea. So you, you're probably used to the concept of ordinary cryptography. So with ordinary cryptography, I use a password to lock something, and you use the same password to unlock that thing, right? So it's one key in and out. Asymmetric encryption is a way cooler thing that has a pair of keys. And anything that is encrypted with pair with one key can only be decrypted with the other. 
And anything encrypted with the other can only be decrypted with the first. The keys are the same, they're symmetrical, but you choose to keep one private that you will never share with anyone, and the other one you can give to anyone without compromising your security. And then the way you can, basically the only the owner of the private key can decrypt something encrypted with the public key. So the way a pass key works is that your phone, and it's your phone, keeps the private key, and the website is handed the public key. So to verify that you are you, the website encrypts some random garbage of their choice and gives it to you and says, if you are you, you can tell me what I told you. And because you have the private key, you are the only person on planet Earth who can answer back with the answer to that. And what's actually happening is that your phone is storing the private keys on your phone, and you are in full control of those private keys. And instead of you having to generate a key for every website, which would be a giant big chore, pass keys does the key generation for you. So it, every time you go to a website, it makes a key pair. I keep one, I share the other. I keep one, I share the other. And it's very difficult for us human beings to keep track of which website belongs to which key. So it just keeps a little database on your device, this website, this key. And the, the keychain will show you your pass keys and the keychain will allow you to export your pass keys. And a synchronization service like a password manager can synchronize your pass keys because they are just private keys. They're nothing more or nothing less than private keys. So they're as open or as closed as passwords, but they have a really big advantage. If you and I are using a password, let's say I'm a user and you're a website. If we use passwords, I give you my password and I trust you not to lose it. And you verify that I'm me because I tell you the password again. But I have to trust you to store my password safely. And reality tells us that there are a lot of yous on this earth who are not trustworthy. With a pass key, I give you a public key. There's no trust there. I haven't given you a secret. The only secret is the private key, which I keep. So if you get hacked to oblivion, you have lost nothing of value to me, the user. And that's a very, very big difference to passwords. It's a zero trust thing. I haven't given you a secret to keep, so you can't lose it. Therefore, you don't have to trust the websites. So I hope that makes sense. It's it's extremely elegantly designed cryptographically. So the, from a few pages ago, there's also a question from Billy McKee. Billy, would you like to unmute and just ask your question and then we'll move on? Uh, Billy? I'm on tenterhooks. Oh, hello, Billy. Yeah. Um, there's an awful lot of um, talk about threat, but actually, you know, you're wasting time. You're almost shooting at uh, the stars. It seems as if a lot of these threats come from India, from Pakistan, from Nigeria. Why can't we hammer that down? Well, because they don't really. So the internet doesn't really have a geography. The internet doesn't really have a place, right? So on the one, at a sort of a human level, the people profiting from cybercrime are indeed usually in parts of the world that have either no functioning government or a functioning government that doesn't really care what us in the West have to say about things, which is why they can exist there because they can put their money in a bank and they can spend their money on Ferraris and they won't go to prison. So the beneficiaries of the cybercrime do indeed tend to be in parts of the world that are not here. But the pathway of getting at your stuff is not geographic. So from my point of view as a victim, I could have ended up being hacked by a webcam two miles down the road. So there's no geography in the attacks. And there's no... So it's, yes, there is a geography to where the human beings are, but there isn't a geography to the technology. And so it isn't a case that we can just turn off India and the problem goes away. Mm -hmm. It will be nice if that were the case, but not having geography is one of the things threat actors do. It's one of the things attackers do is hide their place. And the internet is very good at letting us hide our place. So you won't see the connection coming from India, even if ultimately that's what the benefit is. 
Thank you. So we have, a, sorry, a couple more que tiny questions have appeared. So uh, Bart, if you Great. don't mind dealing with them. No, no, um, the, the, the whole point is interactive, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, Liz, Liz Gardner, would you like to unmute and just quickly ask your question? Yes, thank you, Mike. Yes, um, how soon will the pass keys be available? I, I Right now, today, if you're in purely an Apple's ecosystem, and if you are on the latest version of all of their operating systems, then your devices are ready. Oh, lovely. But the thing is, the internet has to be ready too. Uh -huh. So what we're now waiting on is the websites to start supporting this. So PayPal recently put into preview mode, pass keys for Americans. And they're rolling it out slowly, geography by geography. So they went with, sorry, let me be even more correct. Americans using iPhones were the first people to be allowed to use pass keys on PayPal. They expanded it to Americans using iPhones or Android last week or the week before. And they are talking about expanding it to a few more countries soon. So that gives you an idea that it's it's coming. And so your phone is ready, your PC, your, your Mac is ready. But the rest, the, the internet has to join in too. Okay, thank you. So it's coming, it's coming. Lovely, thank you very much. Thank you. And Karen McCulloch, and then we'll move on, please. Karen, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, and thank you for inviting us to this meeting. Not um, what, what is the difference between a push notification and a one-time base one, let's see, one time, ah. one time base, one time password? Okay, yeah, a TOTP. Just call them Google Authenticator because Google invented it. They didn't make it open source. Okay, so a push notification is a message being sent to you from the service you're trying to prove your identity to, right? So the if you're trying to authenticate to Gmail, then the push notification will come from Google. And that goes to your phone through a secure channel, and it arrives on your phone as a number they sent, and you prove you got it by sending it back to them. So that's a simple... Secure channel of communication, send you a message and you echo it back. The time-based codes don't work like that. So at the moment in time you set up your Authenticator app, what's actually happened is a secret, we call it a secret key, but it's just a big long string of numbers has been chosen. And Google have a copy of that string of numbers and your phone has a copy of that string of numbers. And you take that string of random gibberish and you take the current time rounded to the nearest 30 seconds and you put them together through some very, very basic math and six digits pop up. And so as long as your phone has the right time to within 30 seconds and the server has the right time to within 30 seconds, you both agree on the code. And so your phone is calculating the code based on the secret you shared before and their server is calculating the code on the secret you shared before and that's how it works. That help? Um, so if you're doing a, a, a order on Amazon mm -hmm. and let's see, I guess they don't send you a push notice. Oh yes, they do. When you try to log in, they'll give you a, a number. That's a push notification then. If it Is arrives on your phone in some sort of, so where does this notification arrive? Does it arrive in your messages app or does it arrive in the Amazon app? It would arrive in the Amazon. Okay, then if it's in the Amazon app, it's a push notification. So okay. you're entirely within their ecosystem. So it's them sending you through their secure channel. And that's great. Right? That's okay. a really good method. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And that's that's a good example of what I'm about to come to on my next slide, actually. So will I use this as a um, segue then? Will I take this as a perfect segue? <laughs> so I want to talk to you about the crown jewels. Right? This is really, really important. Because remember I said, folk, you only have so much energy. So you should focus it where it really matters. And so if I ask you what the crown jewels are, I know everyone here will say they're banking sites. That's an easy crown jewel for everyone to get. If, if my money is there, it's important. The next one, I don't think people realize how valuable it is. Almost every website on planet Earth uses emails to reset passwords. If you lose your email address, you basically lose your entire online identity. Because someone can go, if someone takes over your email, they can go to every website on the planet where you use that email address and reset your password. They then have your password and you don't. So your email provider is the crown jewels. If you have Apple devices, then your Apple ID is controlling everything that syncs and that is backed up. 
your photos, your contacts, your calendars, there's so much stuff in your Apple ID. It is the crown jewels. If you're an Android user, your Google ID is doing exactly the same work. And I'm really calling out your photos here because we all have those precious memories. So that is the crown jewels. And if you do a login with dot, 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 well, you've now trusted one site to be your identity to lots of sites. Well, that one site is now the crown jewels because it has access to lots of things. So if you're a login with Facebook person, well, then Facebook's really important. If you're a login with Google person, then Google is really important. If you do a login with Apple, which I would recommend if you're going to do a login with anyone, uh, then your Apple ID again is really important. So if you use someone to log into something, the someone is one of your crown jewels. So your, your money, your email, your Apple ID, and anyone you use to log into other sites, they're your crown jewels. And Put your effort, your mental energy into protecting those. Give those two-factor authentication. And then you don't have to stress quite as much about the rest, right? Because remember, we're all human. I know you can't do everything everywhere. I don't. No one does. In terms of digital hygiene, the other thing I want to say about accounts is don't make an account if you don't need to. Don't go around random websites and making an account just because. If you need an account, you need an account. But if you don't, don't set them up. If you do create accounts and then you leave a place, Clean up after yourself, delete your account because it can't be hacked if it doesn't exist anymore. Um, I would say sign in with is fantastic, particularly if it's sign in with someone who is trustworthy. So Apple, follow the money with Apple. You pay Apple, you're their customer. So they are not, they don't have any sort of incentive to spy on you. So sign in with Apple is great because when you follow the money, it goes to all the right places. If your work pay for a Microsoft Office 365 or a Google work account, well, they're the customer, they're paying for it. So again, trustworthy sign in with. If you pay Microsoft or Google for something, well then great, they're trustworthy too. Be very wary of signing with Facebook or signing with Twitter because they make money by selling your privacy. So do you really want to tell them everywhere on the internet you go? And do you trust Elon Musk with anything? <laughs> uh, and then the other thing I would say, just online, don't share more than you need to. If an account lets you enter in everything about yourself, don't enter in what isn't needed. Right? Enter in as little as possible. Don't overshare. Uh, I see a raised hand from a very familiar face. Hi, yes. Simon. Do you, you may as well, since I'm about to change slide, I'm happy to interrupt you between changing slides. So go for it. Or, you, Simon? Or, or do you have your raised hand up for not to ask me a question? No, 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 it's all right. I'd, um, you were talking about, um, you know, signing with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of, uh, a company called Simple Login, who are now part of Proton out of Switzerland, who mm -hmm. offer you an email alias service where you can create fake email addresses on the fly to create. And so if you want to, you know, if you go to, I don't know, go blogs is cheap sneakers dot com and they say you've got to create an account before you can buy a cheap pair of sneakers. You can generate a, a fake email account, use it, it's aliased and will come to whatever email account you want it um, sent to. And of course, if they then start sending you endless spam saying we've got, you know, Air Jordans for $10 or this, that or the other, you simply trash that email address and then after that, all they ever get is this email address doesn't exist. Um, there's also another company I've used called 33mail.com, both of which are free, which allow you basically to generate aliases to log into, you know, random sites. Random city sites. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then you can trash them when you're done. So I'm just throwing that out there. Hi, Bart. Uh, nice yay. to meet you. Likewise, I, I would just say, by the way, follow the money on those sites. Uh, Proton, Proton, I can stand over. The other side, I don't know about. Uh, but remember that Apple will give you this kind of stuff for free. So since you're already a paying Apple customer, the follow the money works quite well for letting Apple do the the random. There's also, yes. Well, I, I was using simple login um, way before Apple started introducing their, um, you know, hide my email, which is a similar service. 
But yeah. um, simple login. Um, a, I've had the guy on my on, on my show, and B, uh, he's been absorbed by Proton, and it's now being offered as part of the Proton cool. service. Yeah. So yeah, they, you know, this is definitely they're definitely kosher. So it's, it's they are no Proton have earned the trust of the community for many years. So I, I would agree with that. Proton are good. Okay, uh, I realize that it's three minutes from our official end time, but we have been doing questions as we go. So I'd say I have about oh, but, 15 minutes. But, yes. Nine o'clock. Nine, yeah, half past. Well, you said an hour, right? So it's been an hour since I started talking, but you said we could go on to an hour and a half. Oh, yeah, easy, so, easy, easy, easy. So, and uh, yeah. no, this is brilliant. So please don't, uh, yeah, don't, don't feel uh, stressed. Okay, good, 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 good. Thank good. you. Because um, I'm enjoying this conversation, so I'm, I'm hoping you haven't bored people's pants off. Okay, so software that I definitely want to talk about, and software means like your apps, your plugins, and extensions to things, right? It's all software. If the biggest takeaway from here, I hope, is don't pirate software. As someone who writes software, I do have a slight vested interest. I kind of think it's fair to pay people for their hard work, but it's also absolutely riddled with malware. If you read reports of how, particularly in Apple land, how are people getting their Macs hacked? The vast majority of Macs that end up riddled with malware, the malware was invited in by the user trying to get a free copy of Photoshop. In fact, it always seems to be Photoshop. Um, free software, no, not free software. Stolen software is almost always too good to be true. It's almost always full of nasty stuff. Don't pirate software. The other thing is, every time you're installing software, it's an act of trust. You have trusted other human beings to create some code running on your computer. Now, there's two, two aspects of that trust. Are they competent? Because they could be the best meaning human beings on planet Earth, but they may be terrible at writing code. So you may have just put really buggy code on your computer, and that makes it vulnerable to attackers. Or they might not be nice people. So it's an act of trust, both do they mean well and are they competent, right? Two acts of trust. So install the software you need, no less than you need, but no more than you need. Don't install stuff for the crack. Or if you do, uninstall it if it doesn't work out. Right? If, you're, if you're trying to find an app to do something and you have five to try, yeah, install them. But uninstall four when you're done, right? So just, it's an act of trust, so treat it that way. It's also, I would say, very important to get your software from reputable sources. So here in Apple land, we are very lucky because there is only one app store that checks software and then publishes it. There are other app stores, right? The Microsoft store, the Google store, they publish and then check if someone reports a problem. That means that malware doesn't last long on the Android store, but it was published a couple of thousand people got it, and then it was deleted, if you're lucky. So Apple's proactive approach is definitely the safest of all the app stores. So that's like the highest tier of best thing to do. Go to the Apple App Store. If it's in there, you are on as firm a footing as you can be. The App Store is not perfect, but it's the least imperfect of everything out there. If you can't stay within your app stores, the next level down is your trusted brands, right? If you if you buy software directly from Microsoft or Adobe, you're not really in much danger, right? Those companies have a lot on the line and have earned trust for many years. That's not playing fast and loose, right? That's a perfectly safe thing to do. Next down the rung would be long running open source projects that have earned the community's trust. Firefox are trustworthy because Firefox have been doing their thing for ages and we, they're open source so we can trust them. Some random app invented last week may also be open source. It's not trustworthy because it's open source, right? An open source project needs to have earned trust over time. And then the other thing you can do is outsource your trust. So if you don't feel you're in a position to judge, if you trust, say, Neelai Patel or John Gruber or some of these people, well, then if they recommend it, you can piggyback on their work and say, well, I trust this person or this website, maybe you trust the wire cutter or whatever, right? You can outsource your trust to someone trustworthy, but be very wary of just downloading random stuff and running it. It's just not safe. The other thing is, if you are going outside of your official stores, 
Go to the source. Don't get Firefox from download.com. Get Firefox from Firefox. Get Office from Microsoft. Get Photoshop from Adobe, right? Get your software from source, because if you're not getting it from source, you're back to the follow the money thing. Why is someone spending server resources hosting someone else's software and not charging you for it? What have they done? Either they've advertised at you and filled you up with tracking cookies or whatnot, if you're lucky, or the thing is full of malware. Either way, get it from the official source because otherwise something smells wrong. And the other thing I would say is, if you didn't go looking for the software, do not install it. If something pops up unbidden and offers you some software, no, right? If you want software, you'll go find software. If software comes looking for you, it's looking for you for all the wrong reasons. Don't, don't install random things just because they offer themselves to you. And then, you know, a bit like the old joke about voting, vote early, vote often. Patch early and patch often. Keeping your software up to date is the single most important practical thing you can do. If you have that little red badge on your iPhone showing you that there's software updates waiting, install them. If you have the little red badge in your Mac show over the settings app, patch your Mac. If Office says, oh, hi, I need an update. Can I restart now? Yes, you can. Or yes, you can this evening when I'm done with this spreadsheet. But keep your software patched because there are... All software is written by human beings. All human beings make mistakes. Therefore, all software is full of mistakes. Whenever the mistakes are found, two things happen. The authors of the software fix that mistake they found, and the baddies know about the mistake. So you now are in a race to fix your copy of the software before the baddies have a chance to use the mistake against you. So patch early and patch often. There is a non-zero chance that installing a patch will make something break. There is also a non-zero chance that running insecure software will get you completely and utterly hacked. It's not patch and everything, patch and take a risk or don't patch and take no risk. It's patch and take a small risk or don't patch and take a huge risk. So just remember that the risk of doing nothing with software updates is not zero. The risk of doing nothing is really high. So yes, there is a risk to patching. It is lower than the risk of being unpatched. And I think a lot of people forget that because we all hear these things about, I installed a Microsoft update once and it broke my word for a week. It, that, I will not say that never happens. That is very, very rare. But compared to being attacked by malware, it is, that is way more common. The danger from being unpatched outweighs the small risk of patching. Patch early, patch often. And I'm not a do as I say, not as I do person. I patch immediately. Always. And I do that for two reasons. A, because I want to be safe. And B, because if there is a problem, I want to be the one who walks into it so that I can warn others. But honestly, patch early, patch off. And I do it. I have it. I'm fine. I mean, it's my, my stuff is working. I'm presenting to you. My sides aren't broken. Patch early, patch off. Um, right. I'm going to move on to digital literacy. And I will say that the three most important things to understand is the meaning of the digital addresses we bump into. Domain names, URLs, and email addresses. How do they work? Because then you can spot fakes. The other thing is that padlock in the browser. What does it really mean? Because it doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. And if we had, if this was a series rather than a single presentation, I would do a whole big thing about what a verified badge on social media means. What I will say instead is, if you do use social media, take the time to understand what the badge on the media you use means. I'll give you a little cheat sheet. If you're on Twitter and you think the verified badge means something, it means they paid Elon. That is it. That is all it means. It does not mean that they are who they say they are. It does not mean that they are not evil. It doesn't mean anything other than that they paid $8 a month to Elon. So that tick box is now meaningless. Facebook have announced a verification program and they're going to make people submit photo ID. So Facebook's tick boxes will be meaningful when they come out, but they're not out just yet. So whatever social media you use, don't put any stock in a tick button unless you understand what people had to do to earn the tick button. Is it hand deal on eight euro or eight dollars or is it prove yourself through photo ID, et cetera? Very different things. 
So let's look at the domain name because they are at the center of everything, right? We humans don't know our IP addresses. That's the actual addresses going on. But when two computers talk to each other, it's over IP addresses. I don't know mine. You don't know yours. Thank goodness we don't have to know them. But the only reason we don't have to know them is because we've added this layer of nice human-friendly names on top of this infrastructure. So google.com, bartb.ie, right? whatever your mug's uh, website is, right? We have these domain names. So they're a bunch of names separated by dots, and you read them from right to left, which is backwards. But that's how it works. So .ie is actually the top level domain. BartB.ie is something we call the apex domain, and that's really important. And then anything to the left of that is pretty much irrelevant. That's a subdomain. So IE means Ireland, Bart B.ie means I bought something in Ireland and everything below that is under my control. So I can make, you know, whatever I want dot Bart B.ie. So the stuff to the left is irrelevant. The stuff to the right is important. Um, most places have single dots on the end. So Ireland is dot IE, a commercial stuff is dot coms. There are one or two countries, uh, Australia and the UK immediately leaped to mind. He went and double barreled it. So Dakota UK is kind of one thing. So for British websites, the important bit is whatever uk. But it's the whatever.com, the whatever.ie, the whatever.co.uk. That's the important bit. And everything to the left of that is not important. And there is nothing to the right of the right. So it's all about the apex domain. So mybank.com really is mybank.com. www.mybank.com is the subdomain of mybank.com. The important bit is mybank.com. Secure.mybank.com. The important bit is mybank.com, right? That's the apex domain, mybank.com. So anything that mybank.com is mybank.com. Fake stuff. My bank dash com dot something else. That's really common. You see my bank dash com dot co or my bank dash com dot UK or something. The other one that's completely meaningless, that's very tricky is my bank dot something or dot com dot something. My bank dot com dot bank. Well, actually the apex domain is com dot bank. That's not your bank. Mybank.com.github.io is an even worse example of this, right? Yes, it contains mybank.com, but look where it is. It's off to the left, to the least important bit. Bit to the right is the important bit. So github.io is actually the apex domain, and the mybank.com is there to trick you. So yes, check for your bank's URL, your bank's domain, but make sure it's on the far right. Make sure that your bank's domain is at the very, very right of the domain. Because if it's off to the left, it's not really your bank. Uh, am I making sense, right? The right is the important bit. So look what's on the right. That's what really matters. So domain names are used in two really important ways. Domain names form the heart of web addresses, right? The domain name is part of your URL. So a URL like HTTPS colon slash slash www.bartb.e forward slash blog question mark P equals one, two, three, right? That's a URL. That has four parts. There's the scheme colon slash slash the domain slash. So your domain name is hiding between the two slashes and the first slash. So that's really important to know that everything after the first slash is not the domain name anymore. And that's something people use to trick people. Then you have the path, which is entirely made up by the owner of the website. And then you might have a question mark followed by some more gibberish. Again, that's made up by the person who runs the website. So the, the bit before the colon slash slash, HTTP means no encryption. HTTPS means encryption. Great. When you're trying to figure out, is this URL real? The domain name is the part you need to focus on. And thankfully, Modern browsers like Safari bold the domain name for you. So if you look in your Safari address bar, the domain name is actually bolded. It stands out from the rest of the URL. And that's lovely because that's the important bit, right? So whether you do it because your browser helps you or whether you do it yourself, filter the big, long, icky URL down to that domain name. That's what matters. And then we see the previous slide for how that matters. Uh, and then the other thing to watch out for, it is possible to optionally do colon and then some numbers. That's 
a port number. That's not normal for public facing websites. If you see a URL with those port numbers, either it's a camera or something weird on your own on your own personal network and you're expecting it to be some little weird thing in your own personal network, or there's something funny going on. If you see port numbers, that that's a red flag. So real addresses, right? HTTPS colon slash slash mybank.com. Nice and simple. Between the two slashes and the first slash, mybank.com. Great. A little bit more complicated. HTTPS colon slash slash www.mybank.com forward slash login. We're interested in the bit between the two slashes and the first slash. www.mybank.com. What's the apex domain? Mybank.com. We're good. Similarly, we can stick a question mark something or other on the end. We're still good, right? What's between the two slashes and the first slash? www.mybank.com. The apex domain is mybank.com. We're good. Fakes then. Well, the old trick of make the domain wrong. So mybank-com.co, right? Same problem as on the previous slide. Mybank.com.bank. Same problem as on the previous slide. Mybank.com.github.io forward slash whatever. Same problem as on the previous site. I, I managed to duplicate my example there. It, that, yeah, you can delete that one. That's just a duplicate. So the next one I really want to draw your attention to is some other domain forward slash mybank.com. Mybank.com is after the first slash. Auga, Auga, Auga. That's not the domain name. That's the file name. It's after the first slash. Similarly, if it's after the question mark, that's not the domain name, right? They've hidden mybank.com. It's in there, but it's not in the right place. So it's not where you are. That's what I'm saying. After the slash slash, up to the first slash, that's where your attention is. That's where the scammers are making you try not to look. And they'll put your real, your real mybank.com somewhere else that they control in the hope that you don't notice is in the wrong place. But focus like a laser between the two slashes and the first slash. Laser focus in there and you'll be on the right path. Very similar then with email, which is a two-part thing. Something you've made up at some domain name. So the user part, don't let that distract you. Again, we're focusing on the domain part. And again, watch the apex domain. So a little extra bonus here that we don't get with websites. If you're dealing with a major corporation, they will not be using a free email service like Gmail or Hotmail. So mybanksecurity at gmail.com. No, your bank will have their own email. They're not going to be using Gmail or whatever, right? So if a major corporation, except for Google, uh, is using Gmail, there's something wrong. So that's another little bonus tip there. So spotting the fakes, right? So what is correct? Tom at mybank.com. Nothing suspicious there. After the at is mybank.com. That's the apex domain. Great. Support at mybank.com. Again, the bit after the at is mybank.com. Great. Tom at support.mybank.com. The domain is support.mybank.com. But what's to the far right of the domain? Mybank.com. We're still good here. Right, this is all fine. How do we fake people? At mybank.com.co, at mybank-com.co, at mybank.com.bank. Right, the apex domain is com.bank, not mybank.com. And the ultimate fake, you put the domain name on the wrong side of the at. Mybank.com at something else. Well, it's the at something else is where it's really going. So again, whatever's to the right of the at is where you should be laser focused, right? What goes before the at, distracting you. What's after the at? And then look for that apex domain. So the right of the domain name is what matters. In a URL, focus in on what's between the two slashes and the first slash, and then look to the right. On an email address, ignore everything before the at. Take that as your domain name. And again, look at it from right to left. So I'm... Um, Hoping that's not too confusing. I saw a lot of you hold your phones close to the screen to take screenshots. These slides, I'm happy to publish these, whatever way you guys do that normally. These videos are available. So those three slides, 
take a screenshot of them. I'm hoping they're valuable to you. That is how they try to trick us. They put mybank.com somewhere, but if they put it in the wrong place, it's meaningless. You need to have enough of an understanding of the structure to recognize that they've, the cheeky sods have put it in the wrong place. You have to, you know, ever present vigilance, be suspicious. Okay, the other one I really, I'm in a little bugbear here, right? For years, people have been giving the wrong advice. Look for the padlock and you're safe. No, it's only half true. If the padlock isn't there, you're definitely not safe. So that is true. But just because the padlock is there does not mean you are safe. The padlock does have meaning and it's very important meaning. It's, it's, the, it's the core of encryption actually. So the padlock means three things. So we computer scientists call it authenticity. If I have a padlock and the URL says google.com, the padlock means I am genuinely on google.com. No one has snuck themselves between my browser and the internet and put a fake google.com. The padlock means my browser is at the actual website in the address bar. So it is. you really are at PayPal. You really are at mybank.com. You really are at whatever. And that's really important that the address bar is real. That's what the padlock means. But if you have a padlock that says mybank.hacker.com, then the padlock means you're really on the attacker's website. You're really on hacker.com. Right, So the padlock means you really are where the address bar says you are. So yes, you have to see the padlock, but you have to go look at the address bar to make sure that the address bar is somewhere you think you are. Am I really at PayPal? The other thing that is promised by the padlock is integrity. So if you're logging into PayPal, you need to be sure that when they send you the login page and when you send your username and password, that no one between you and them can intercept that communication and inject something fake. They could inject a script that makes you send your password to the bad guys instead of to PayPal or whatever. So the fact that the padlock means no one tampered with either the page coming to you or your reply going to the page is really important. Imagine you're on a bank doing a money transfer. If the padlock wasn't there, a baddie between you and the bank could change the destination bank account number and routing code. That would be bad. So the integrity is actually a very important guarantee from the padlock. What you see is what they sent, and what you send is what they receive. So that integrity is vital. And then the final thing the padlock promises is confidentiality. It is encrypted. Whatever was sent from the bank to you really came from the website in the address bar. It wasn't altered and no one else saw it. There are the three things. And when you reply, when you send something to PayPal, no one else can see what you sent to them. So you really are what the address book says. What you see is what was sent and what you send will be received and no one else can see it. There are the three things the padlock offers. And that's really powerful. That is the basis of all of e-commerce but you still have to look at the address next to the padlock because anyone can put a padlock on a malicious website. The padlock just means you are where the browser says you are. Always check. Is it really PayPal? A particularly nasty thing is that you can use what are called homoglyphs. You can use letters that look like other letters. So paypal.com, where it's actually not an O or say not an A, but a four or something that has an O in it, a zero instead of an O or something with an L, it could be a capital I. Thankfully, your password manager will have your back here because password managers will offer you the password only for the correct website in the address bar. So if the address bar looks like PayPal, but the L is actually a capital I, you, the human being, will be fooled, but a password manager won't because a password manager is a purely computer thing. It knows that an L and a capital I are completely different things. I can't tell by looking at it, but the password manager can. So that's another really good reason for password managers is it keeps you safe from websites that look right, but aren't. Okay, uh, I'm trying to remember if this is my last slide. I have a distinct impression it's my second last slide. Yes, it is. Okay, good. So I wanted to end on a happy note. 
Right. So this may not sound like a happy note, the final page of Microsoft's latest threat report, but trust me, there's a positive message here. <laughs> so one of the things I have to do in my day job is read these massive big reports from the major companies because they all report on what they've seen in the real world. So Microsoft, when they run something like Office 365, are serving billions of people. So they know what attacks are happening in the real world because their customers are everywhere and their customers are suffering. So every year they summarize the state of the union in terms of security. And this year's report, it came out two weeks ago, it covers 2022, is 108 pages long. I had to read almost all of it. This is page 108. So Microsoft know that you will read the first page and you will read the last page and you're not likely to read anything in between. So what did they think was the most important message to leave people with? What did they think was the single thing they wanted everyone who read that report to remember? It's the bit I put a red circle on. Basic security hygiene still protects against 98% of attacks in the real world. Microsoft are watching millions of people and in the real world, 98% of attacks are protected against by doing the basics. So the good hygiene, the ever-present vigilance, 98% of the time, it's all you need. Do the basics. You don't get 5% of the coverage from doing 5% of the work. If you do the basics, you get 98% of the coverage. So take the time to do the easy stuff. It, you're not wasting your time. It really, really helps. On that note, I will hand Fantastic. over to questions. Thanks so much, Bart. Um, I, ju I just want to read something, uh, uh, which I, I, you know, is lovely to see in, in the comments. Uh, this has been the most fabulous, insightful presentation that I can recall. Um, oh, and I think. Um, and you can see me blushing because I am on video. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, great. So uh, Jim Turney has a question about shortened URLs. Jim, would you like to unmute and just yeah. ask that question? Uh, sure. Um... The shortened URLs, you know, long before Elon Musk got hold of Twitter, they came out with this ridiculous idea that the Internet needed very few characters and they made everybody use very, very short length messages. And so that, of course, motivated companies like Bitly to start uh, allowing people to shorten URLs, but using their domain names. So you don't really know where you're going. And I've noticed that even on websites where there is no length problem for URLs, especially since they're under a word like click, uh, they're using shortened mm. URLs. And I think they're dangerous because you don't they know are. where they're being taken. So I didn't hear you mention that. I thought I would just ask what your opinion is of that matter. I, I have a few comments to make on that. So my first thought is initially they were actually invented for a really good reason. If I need to tell you something, I can't give you a long URL. So with my work hat on, we run our own link shortener. Uh, so our full website domain for Google juice reasons is manuthuniversity.ie. That's a mouthful. If I want to pay for an advertisement on the radio, I need to give someone something really easy like opendays at mu.ie or opendays.mu.ie. So we use a link shortener to get people to our full website easily. So open days is actually going to be manuthuniversity.ie forward slash open days forward slash 2023. Right. Could never say that on a radio ad. So there are legitimate link shorteners. Uh, Steve Gibson has a link shortener on every episode of his security podcast. It's always grc.com forward slash and then the episode number. That's a fantastic convenience. So that's a good use of them. And then they turned evil because if you follow the money, and you're trying to make money off selling people's privacy, well, wouldn't it be great to be able to track everyone who clicks on a link? Well, a shortened link means that you go to the link shortener and then you go to the place you were going last. So the link shortener knows where you came from and where you're going. So in terms of building up a profile to sell to advertisers, that's amazing. So I know that you're interested in, or you're a Facebook user and you're interested in astronomy. Because I have where you came from and where you're going. That's why Twitter have their own link shortener. It's purely to spy on what people are doing. 
So they're evil in that sense. Then someone discovered that you can play tricks with people and it, the concept of rick rolling was invented to prove how dangerous link shorteners are. So you send someone a link shortener promising to be to something useful and it's Rick Astley saying they're never going to give you up. That was the th- You couldn't go anywhere on the internet for a couple of years without getting Rick Astley'd, right? So that proves the danger. So you're right, they're dangerous for your privacy and they're dangerous because you don't know where you're going to end up. But I didn't focus on them in the talk for the very simple reason that I don't like to be Debbie Downer and tell people things they can't do much about. I'm afraid to say your choice is either never click on a shortened link or understand that it's going to take you somewhere else. And then the moment you arrive, check the address bar. Where did I end up? The the person's tweet promised me I was going to mybank.com. I clicked the link shortener. Did I really? Go to mybank.com. So I think the advice that works universally is where you finish, right? The page has loaded. You are about to interact with it. That's the point you glance up at the address bar. Where have I actually arrived? How you got there is a secondary issue. If you always remember to check where you are at the moment you're doing something, that's the best you can do. And I will just add, there's actually a third, there's another use of link shorteners that's actually really positive. So a lot of corporations use something called link protection. So if you email my work self with a link to something, what arrives in my inbox is a shortened link that actually goes to the virus scanner for my corporation. And it will virus scan the link before redirecting me. And so that means that, yes, I'm using a link shortener. And I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I am having an antivirus between me and arriving. So that's a positive use of a technology that's potentially dangerous. But again, the simple advice is it, what matters is where you arrive, not how you got there. And so always check the address as you arrive, called the resting URL in fancy pants terms. That's the important thing. Where have I arrived? Check that's okay. And then continue. It's kind Thanks. of the best I can do. Great advice. Appreciate it. Chris Frank has a very short question. Chris, would you like to unmute and ask that question? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to know if VPNs can protect you in any way, and if so, how? Ah, well, that's a bit, it's a bit like asking, is a pen knife good for something? Yes. Yes, it is. But VPNs are extremely flexible and they do very different things. So there are many security uses for VPNs. Uh, A good example would be a corporation can run a VPN so that when when we're all working from home for COVID, you use the VPN to make a secure connection from your laptop at home into the corporate network, and then you can behave as if you are in the office. So that's using a VPN to securely enter a secured environment. So that's one use of a VPN. Another use of a VPN is that you pay someone to put a VPN on the internet that you have access to from wherever you are. And that gives you a secure connection between your computer and this server on the internet you've paid for. Now, or hopefully you've paid for. And we'll get back to that in a second because that's a really important point. The purpose here is that you are in a hotel or a coffee shop or a cruise ship. You are somewhere where you do not trust your immediate neighbors. You're on a hostile network. Then you now have a secure connection to the internet at large. And then your traffic is on the internet along with everyone else's. So you're protected from the people near you. But after you leave the VPN, you're not protected anymore. So in the United States, it's legal for ISPs to spy on their customers and sell their data for profit. In the UK and Ireland, it is not. So it is very common in the US to use a VPN even from home because you're protecting yourself from your own ISP. But that's all you're protecting yourself from. If you go to, if you use a VPN to connect to a malicious website, you're still connected to a malicious website. The VPN hasn't, it's not magic fairy dust that makes everything safe. It is providing a safe method of two endpoints, you know, it's a safe path from one place to another. What matters is where the other place is and whether or not that's enough to protect you from the problem you're trying to defend yourself from. So VPNs are a part of a lot of security solutions, but they're not a unicorn that just makes everything fine. If I use a VPN, I'm safe. No. Why are you using it? How are you using it? What threat are you protecting yourself from? And the final point I really want to make 
Remember I said this is all about economics and you should follow the money. The single worst thing you can do is get a free VPN service because it costs money to have a fast connection to the internet and servers with plenty of resources. To run a VPN, which is encrypted, you need to have very fast internet and a lot of computing power to do the encryption. That's expensive. If I'm not paying for the VPN, how are they making their money? The answer is, if you're lucky, they're just selling your privacy. But they are the end of the encryption. So they have the power to see the stuff before and after it's encrypted. They can alter what goes through the encryption. They can inject ads if you're lucky or malware if you're not into your web browsing because they're in a privileged position. You have, you have given them a privileged position between you and the internet. So it is an immense trust to use a VPN. You really, like I said, software was a trust. A VPN is an Uber trust. So if it's free, you have made yourself less secure. If you're buying a VPN from a trustworthy service, people like TunnelBear are actually audited by outside auditors. Uh, I think PricewaterhouseCooper do the auditors for TunnelBear. Those, you know, a Nord VPN and stuff, the reason they're doing those audits by those expensive companies is because it's such a level of trust, they have to be able to prove they're safe. So if you pay for a service from a reputable company, it is a real security tool with real value. It only does what you've configured it to do. It's not a unicorn. And definitely, definitely, definitely never, ever, ever use a free VPN, ever. I hope that helps. I have a, a, statement followed by, a statement followed by a question. So I'm actually just going to read these because it will be quicker. Uh, Giovanni says, Safari has a feature that allows to check the URL in a protected window. And Chris Wilde has typed underneath, please explain. I assume relating to that question. I... I'm not a trained Apple expert. I am not aware of a Safari feature that does what's described there. Right. So either it's a misunderstanding. So one of either I don't know everything Safari can do, or there's a misunderstanding about what a Safari feature does. But I don't believe there is a way to do what's being described there, unless it's some sort of third-party plugin, which is possible because Safari supports plugins. So maybe the user has a plugin installed as doing something extra. Apple did introduce a thing uh, which is like a pseudo VPN that if you pay for iCloud, they call it iCloud Plus, they will do X. It's, it's actually very good VPN like protection that gives you um, confidentiality, but it's not verifying it isn't malware. I know oh, there is one other thing that is happening in Safari. Uh, there, is a, there is a list maintained of known evil websites and safari subscribe to that list and safari will stop you going to a website that's known malicious mm. and it will put up a big red warning saying auga auga you're going somewhere dangerous so that is also happening but none of those tools are quite sort of i guess you could describe that as checking for malware right it's it is checking everything you browse against a list of known bad sites but there's a big difference between a list of known bad sites and every bad thing on the world. So it's, you know, it's good, but it's no utopia. That's not as satisfying an answer as I'd like to give, but it's the best I could do, I'm afraid. Brilliant. No, it's brilliant. This has been such a good evening. I had such good vibes about this when you sent your notes over. And uh, Oh, good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, there's so much lovely stuff. I'd, um, I, I, I'll make sure that... Um, well, in fact, you know, no, you don't. So if you want to save a copy of the chat, it's the little three dots at the bottom of the window. Yeah, because I have I have full power, of course, because you made you me do. a... Uh, but I can send it to you anyway. But um, yes, but excellent. Much, much well-earned appreciation. And thank you very much indeed for spending time with us this evening. This has been an absolutely outstanding session and um, can't thank you enough. Yeah, yeah, honestly, it was my it was my absolute pleasure, Thank folks. You. you were you were a wonderful group of people to spend an evening with. It was my pleasure, and uh, it's so nice to see that these communities still exist. So, best of luck, <laughs> well, especially your transatlantic, you, right? Great. Could I trouble you just to unshare so that we can see you? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, my, my face has been hidden all this time. Oh, no. Well, it's not hidden, but it's tiny. Mm -hmm.
It's tiny. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, there's a giant big red like button. That's yeah. better. This tiny the elf giant like person in the corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> folks, um, please, please, please unmute uh, and, and say your thank yous. Great thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you, Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Thanks for your time and your efforts. Thank you. Great. It was brilliant. Thank you. Fantastic night. Oh, yes, brilliant. Yeah. Well, you know. Brilliant. I'm blushing, folks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Have you, you come again? <laughs> yes, please come again. <laughs> if there isn't something alcoholic in that flask, I think you need sorting out. <laughs> there, there isn't because it's a, there isn't because it's workday, but it is. Uh, I, I will say. It's it's very very good homemade coffee. I grind my own beans, and it does have some caramel syrup in it for next. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> well done, mate. Thank you very much. You did a really good job tonight. And the one the one thing I would say when people are talking about link shorteners, also beware of QR codes. Exactly oh, the same. Oh goodness process. me! Yes. Oh yes. Yes. That that's a hidden URL that's so well hidden it looks like a bunch of boxes. Yep. <laughs> By by all means, follow a QR code, but check the what check does, the what, Check where you land. What, check what, where you land, right? What is a QR code, and what so does it mean? Little, there's little square things with a load of boxes in. Yeah, there must be one around here somewhere. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and what what do they do? Do they take away your information, or no, no, no. in and of no. them, if they're harmless, they they direct you to a website. Right. But see, like a link shortener, you don't know where you're going to go until you get there. Right. So always check the address bar to make sure it's, you know, if it says it's from Argos yeah. and look at our latest offers, make sure it says argos.com or argos.co.uk and not dodgy Chinese. Anything. Hacker. Not anything else, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dodgy okay. Chinese hacker dot argos dot co dot UK. You okay. Know. Thank you. And for, for people who aren't familiar with them, so the idea of a QR code is, imagine you're at a bus stop and I want to advertise at you and I want you to go to a website. If I put my big domain name on the bus stop, how many people are going to type that in? Not very many, right? So what they put up on the advertisement is this little box of little boxes. It, it's, it's like a barcode, but it's more complicated. And if you hold your phone up to it, your phone will recognize it and let you go to the web page by just pointing your phone at the at the poster and going to the web page. So it's really easy to just go to a web page. Okay. I don't read QR codes. I don't know what those boxes mean. So that's why it's like a it's a link that's convenient, but you don't know where you're going to end up. Therefore, the advice is check where you've arrived. It's like a short, it's like a link shortener. Right. You know, tiny URL dot. One two three four. Yeah. Slash. Dot whatever. Yeah. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that because it's a lot easier. If I send somebody a tiny URL. Yeah. It will say tiny URL like ea dot com slash page four. Yeah. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh. But a QR code does exactly the same. Right. But when you point your phone at it. I'm glad to say in, in iOS 16, it actually shows you where you're going to go in yellow underneath. Yeah. And if it doesn't look like where you expect to be going, you know, if you point a... a say on if, the telly. If it says Audi, hmm. you know, this is an ad for Audi A5 yeah. or something. Yeah. If it comes up with some weird bleeding long URL, then you're not going to <laughs> Audi.com. Right, you know? okay. Yeah, got you. <laughs> I would say actually the biggest risk with QR codes is places like bus stops because mm -hmm. if I if I was an evil person, right? Yeah. I know that there are ads for, for very legitimate companies on those billboards. Yeah. And on that billboard is the QR code. But the QR code's tiny. Yes. I can buy a sticker and a printer, mm -hmm. and I can print my own QR code and stick it over the one on the poster. Yeah. Um, I have now stolen all of those clicks. And all it took me was a little piece of paper and a sticker, right? Anyone can do that. And then you can do a very convincing phishing attack because it might really be a poster from Audi. Mm, yeah. But if I have stuck my QR code on there, you've gone to my website. Right. Okay. Got Which you. might look like Audi, but it'll be, you know, yeah. Audi dot dot, you know, as you said earlier, Audi dash com slash. Yeah. 
Actually, and to be honest, the much worse ones are like um, ads for a mortgage company or something. Yeah. Or ads for a credit card. Yeah. Those are extra, extra dangerous. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Well, I don't even need the cars in the phone box anymore. One more late question, if yeah. you can face it. Am I too late oh, to ask course, Bart? Am I too late to ask Bart if he's heard of an app called Credas? I certainly haven't. C R E D A S. That one is new to me so far. Um, so I have not yet so heard of no. Credas. Yeah, that's a no. Great. Okay, listen, it's quarter past nine. Uh, I, d I don't want to take up any more of your time. I, I cannot thank you enough for this evening. Absolutely uh, first class yeah. session. Thank you. Brilliant. And we would like right you right back, back at you, folks. You're a lovely bunch. Honest to goodness, <laughs> a lovely bunch of people. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, and we'd All love right. you to come back. Thank you. If I have, if I have something interesting to say, <laughs> I will offer. I will offer again. But excellent. It, it does take a bit of work to be interesting. So you know. Yeah, it's hard work. You know, brilliantly. Well done. Thank you, guys.